Γεια σα, το κοιτάζ πότσο με βρίσκεται στο Guitar for και καλεσμένο μα έχουμε ακόμη μια φορά τον κύριο Τζόναθαν Κράιτσπεργκ. Mr. Κράιτσπεργκ, thank you for taking the time to do this interview with us. Sure. Welcome to Greece again. Great to be this back. This is the, the, the third time, I guess. Well, it's uh, probably the fifth or sixth time I've been in Greece, but yeah, the third time I've been here in the past few years playing music. Okay, yeah. what, what was the purpose of your visit this time? Uh, this was the final concert on the uh, three week tour for Wave Upon Wave that I did with my quartet. And it was great to finish it here in Greece. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how was your experience with uh, the the gig last night? Uh, it's a great, it's a great venue, and ha working with Pantelis and Guitar Four is always great. So, it was a great experience all for all. Maybe I ate a little too much paidakia before the <laughs> concert and it slowed me down for the first tune, but we, we got back. Okay. Okay. So, what's what's new in your career for, since the, the last time we saw you here in Greece? Uh, sure. It was an album that yeah, was yeah. solo guitar. Yeah, so last time I was here, right, one had just come out or was about to come was out? Was about to come out. Yeah, yes. so that was my solo guitar record, which uh, it was uh, an intense experience doing and, and uh, got a lot of great acclaim, which was made me happy because it was a very personal project. Um, and then I uh, basically set to uh, set out to record this, this, this music that I'd been writing and performing with uh, the quartet over the past couple of years and uh, that was called and is called Wave Upon Wave which uh, uh, came out a few months ago and we've been toying like crazy spreading the word. Okay, so where this inspiration comes from? Uh, what what keeps you going all the time with new projects? So different projects from a solo to a quartet and we're gonna discuss what's next afterwards but sure. what's your motivation? What, what, what inspires you? What gives you inspiration? Well, I mean, I find inspiration everywhere. I mean, music itself is pretty inspiring. I mean, I can just basically sit down with the guitar, even if I don't feel inspired, start moving my hands, and before you know it, I'm inspired. I mean, I've been lucky in that way that I just, the act, just music as a purely, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a pure element itself is, is pretty much enough to inspire me for a lifetime or two. Um, but I also get very inspired by a lot of things in life as well, whether it's, uh, you know, relationships, movies, uh, nature, science is always a big one for me. Um, and the new record, Wave Upon Wave, kind of combines a lot of those things, you know. Um, in what way does science uh, inspire you to, to, to write music? Yeah, well, I mean, Music, like I always say, music is kind of like somewhere between science, math, and poetry. You know, it's all kind of these different angles of things. But for me, I mean, one thing about science that's always fascinating to me is that as deep as you can get into analyzing things, you're always going to get to the point of the unknown, you know? And that's like religion and science are related in that way. I mean, if you get to someone even Einstein or any of the astrophysicists, when you get to the end of everything, the beginning of everything, there's always a point where you can't see. You, know? you can understand. Yeah, yeah. And that's what inspired you to write music? For me, yeah, music, as, as much as I uh, can analyze or use theory to explain certain things, there's always this unknown, there's always this mystery and this thing that you can't really put into words. And that's for sure, I mean, what, what the part of music that hooks me, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, basically the science and the mathematics of music, they keep me interested and they keep me trying to explain and understand things, but it's that other thing that is really... It, is this conscious, uh, the mathematics, when you play, when you compose, is it conscious, the mathematics and the science behind the music? Do you think of the, the math? behind the music. No, you, 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 you study it? it. You study it to the point where it becomes part of your subconscious. So for me, it's, a, it's basically whenever I think there's some types of matrices and numbers going off that's happening because that's deep in my subconscious from working on that for years. But no, in the center of my mind, I'm never thinking of those things while I'm playing, you know. I'm trying to channel something and reach that mysterious unknown 
well, it's it's very interesting uh, to to understand what uh, what inspires someone to write something that it is instrumental mm -hmm. because the, there are no li lyrics in the right. song, so the only hint you have uh, for what the composer was thinking was perhaps a title, which in many cases may be relevant right. with the yeah. the, the yeah. source. Yeah, well, that's that's the funny thing about titles is sometimes if if someone hears a music, a piece of music, and it experiences it. Many times they already have some type of feeling or, or image in their head and the title doesn't always fit that. So sometimes I just want to call it number one, number two, number three, number four, number, you know. But uh, at the same time, sometimes a little suggestion is nice to suggest something that you were feeling as a composer when you wrote the tune. Um, Do you sometimes use titles that other people say and sometimes you don't think about this song in that way but you find it interesting? Rarely. I mean, but sometimes. I mean, yeah, my thing with titles is it's a little super, super, superfluous to the, you know, I mean, in some ways. I mean, the music exists as it is, and sometimes you may even get the feeling of the title from this, the song, but sometimes uh, the, the title will come really last, you know. Um, and sometimes I'll actually have an idea of something or even a title, that, and I'll compose something in that feeling, you know. Um, it comes out of a necessity. Yeah. This record basically started from a collection of tunes that I was writing that were based on a feeling at a certain time that I had, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically a couple of years ago um, when I started writing this that music. And then over the, the past year, when I was about to record, I needed a few more tunes and I, I kind of focused everything into this idea. So it's almost like a little bit, this is, not not a concept album in a rock opera sense, but it is. There's a feeling to this this record, and and uh, the last couple of tunes that I composed were definitely coming directly out of that idea. You know, uh, wave upon wave, and until you know, being human. Those tunes were all composed once I already had an idea of what this record was. You know, okay. uh, how how does it work with you when you uh, composing a music that is going to be orchestrated afterwards? Uh, do you have a central idea and then you take the input of other musicians or do you have everything planned out and you expect from the musician to stay true to your uh, original vision? That's a great question. Yeah, and, it, and that's a very uh, widely ranged uh, <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, answer. Yeah, because especially depending on who's answering, you know, but I think most of the guys that play with me would agree that, that I'm somewhere in between the looseness of of what we consider jazz, which to me is today that's considered that way, but there was a time when jazz was very arranged. You know what I mean? If you look at someone like Duke Ellington or uh, Ahmad Jamal Trio, there's a lot of uh, arranged sections. You know what I mean? There's been this thing that developed maybe in the in the '60s and into the '70s where jazz, oh, you just show up and you just feel it. You know, and that's I, I like that, but it's really if I go to a lot of my favorite records, whether it's uh, they have a structure, you know, yeah, yeah, especially you know Coltrane Sound, for instance, super structured record. I mean, there's a lot of looseness within that, but all those heads were very arranged, and he had ideas about what he wanted each guy to do. You know, my music's kind of coming out of that a little bit. I like, I like, I have very specific parts at some points and tempos, but at the same time within that there's a real, there'll be sections of extreme looseness and, and openness, you know. So, I like the, kind of the juxtaposition of those things. Okay. Uh, through your career, uh, did you ever meet uh, musicians that uh, really inspired you to uh, go away from the original vision of a song or a sound that you have imagined? Oh, well, for sure, for sure. I mean, you know, it happens when you play with guys as long as, like, Will, Vincent and I have been playing for 10 years, we figured out the other day, and you, when you compose, you're already hearing their sound in your head, you know. At the same time, when you bring it in, especially to a rhythm section, you expect them to kind of counter some of the things, ideas you had. And that can be great. And it's great to work with a band that's, that's open either way, you know. And I can say, like, with Rick and Colin, it's really, like, you know, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I sing a groove and a specific bass line or something, they, they can adapt to that. 
or they can say, oh, what about this, you know, and like kind of push back and go for something else. And that can be sometimes, oh, yeah, 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 that's, you know, it can, it can change the concept of the song. And that, that's happened plenty of times. So I think, I, I think it, to have that is really, for me, uh, kind of great and necessary. To have guys that can try and realize the original idea, but also can, we can bounce back and go for something else. And then not be upset if, like, if I say, oh, I kind of like this other thing. You know, but then also um, try this stuff. You know what I mean? Not just maybe go with the with uh, the static concept and keeping things loose within those ideas. You know, that's it's really hard to to find in, in jazz today. Okay. You know, what's your routine? Where you're rehearsing with the band? Uh, do you work for a lot of hours, or do no, you take? We, no? we don't rehearse much at all, to be honest. We've uh, like sound music. checks. Sound checks. We had a two-hour rehearsal for Wave Bomb Wave. That was it, you know. But we've been playing a lot of those songs live, so you know that's really where the music happens if you develop it live, you know. And it's more thrilling when the surprises uh, happen yeah. in the stage, or yeah, I think you can hear that on the record. You can hear it on the record that there's things that happen that are never happened before. That's yeah. I think that's what I mean. Is that's an element that I like to keep. As much as you structure certain things, you got to have some of that little surprises and things, you know. Okay. Yeah. And that was part of my reason for adding Kevin Hayes to the session too, because a lot of those gigs we've done in quartet, and I said on these three or four tunes, I want to add Kevin, and and that was basically like I said, we did one two-hour rehearsal. If you ask me and some of our viewers, they would think that you have been rehearsing for yeah. days uh, to, yeah. to be so precise yeah. in the rhythm and the... Yeah. And the That's one of the reasons you moved to New York, because, you know, the, you get the guys that are that heavy that they can sound like that with, with you know, no or little rehearsing, you know, it creates mm -hmm. that, that feeling, you know. It leaves more space for creativity and uh, composing and stuff like that. Yeah. It takes out of the... They has a lot of their logistics. In some ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, t I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to prefer... I, I like rehearsing, but uh, I think there must be a reason that I choose guys that don't tend to like it. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a subconscious reason I do that. Do you see yourself doing something that is completely opposite uh, of what you've been doing so far? Do you feel the need to do that? I have things in my mind that I'm... Projects that I'm working on that... You know, everyone who knows my records and knows me, they know I like doing things with, you know, smaller lineups. So I'm leaning towards maybe some, some duo things. Mm -hmm. That's one of my, the next things I'm, I want to do. Okay. Um, so that's, that's loosely basically some of the areas I'm, I'm checking out. But um, no, I, I just, within the realm of basically what I feel like is happening in my music and my my cohorts music right now this is just a really exciting time in that I described it to someone once that like you have many different periods of jazz that, that were dealing with basically rejection they had to reject certain things in order to achieve what they achieved and I understand that like in other words when you had early jazz that was something where, where jazz and blues were very close and there was a lot of very, a lot of improvisation in those arrangements, you know, uh, sometimes it was just a melody and then everybody was improvising around it. And, you know, if you go back to Louis and earlier stuff. So then you had the reaction of like, the reaction was basically, in the big band era, they basically said no to that. And they said, well, let's arrange everything and have these big bands, these big powerful machines that are basically just moving along. And that was a reaction to the earlier stuff. So to me it was like, they had to not do some of the other thing in order to do that thing. You know what I mean? You had to say, let's, we can't, we need charts. You know, let's not just, because not the early jazz guys, they didn't read, they were just playing by ear, you know? So they said, no, everyone's got their charts, you have these elaborate things, that, you know, that was a reaction. Then you had Bebop come along, which was kind of a reaction, again, saying, you know. We need to be more free. Yeah, we need, and we need to, and we need to not resolve things like that. We have to have notes that, kind of mess with the system, you know what I mean? And we have harmony that does that, and, and drummers that completely break up the beat in a way that wasn't happening. In swing music, you had four on the floor. And those guys came along and said, that was Max Roach and guys like that, right? Totally saying no to that other thing. It would never do that, those earlier rhythms, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't, that wasn't cool. You had to say no to that. 
which I understood because to achieve that level of what he was doing, he had to do that. Then you had free jazz, right? You had a lot of movements that kind of free jazz said, forget everything. form, forget everything, you know? So then you had fusion that came along and said, we have to say, forget about acoustic instruments, forget about, uh, you know, uh, song form, forget about all these things, you know? And that was great because that happened for a reason at the time. So someone kind of was kind of almost implying that like, okay, well, what guys like me are doing now doesn't do that. And like he was making it sound like it was a bad thing, but like that it doesn't have its own identity. But I actually think what we have now is you have the ability to kind of assess all those periods. First of all, we're growing up in time of, of you know, where music education has, has gotten really strong and, and the access to music through our iPod and YouTube and all this stuff. So how do we embrace that and make that all a part of everything? Which I think is happening now. You have basically guys who grew up studying bebop, really understanding classical music and all kinds of stuff, playing fusion, rock, funk gigs, you know, and finding a way to basically put it together uh, in our own way, without rejecting anything. The only thing, well, no, nothing really. Because in my band, it'll get as loud as a fusion band and then get as quiet as a uh, quietest chamber jazz thing, you know what I mean? So it's like, we're trying to embrace things we liked about all, all these kinds of music without saying no to them, really, you know? And that does kind of define what's happening right now in jazz. And I think it's really exciting. There's some guys that are doing it really well, you know? So, so you think that we, we've come to the point that we don't need any more of the titles, we don't need the, the boundaries and the, the, the thing that we have to reject. We, have to, we are in, a, in an era that we accept everything that's been done yeah. and we combine it. Yeah. And what, what's the next step? To me it's just about song to song, just keep composing. I'm not gonna... Yeah, I don't... There may come a time where I will lock myself in a room and say I'm not gonna leave till I think of the next evolution or something like that. But right now it's to me it's, it's the little things, you know. I mean... For me, every time I play a melody, that's a little bit in my head. Like, how can I play this melody where it has the sophistication of, of a bebop line, where it has the, the interesting rhythms of, of uh, Greek music, where it has uh, some 20th fun? century har harmony. I'm, while I'm playing, I'm thinking that. So everything I'm doing now, I didn't want to make it sound like what I'm trying to do is play, you know, like a bebop guy, and then play like a, a you know, a, uh, a free jazz guy and then play like fusion guy. I'm not, I'm not doing that. For me, every moment is trying to assess all those things that I love about those music and put them together into something. If you do that, you are an evolution. You're doing something new. You see what I mean? Yeah. So if you think about how can I do something different, Oh, maybe I can, you know, use... Well, I, was, you know, I was not referring so much in the personal level of yeah. you as an artist, like the scene, where, sure, where, sure. where it's moving. No, but not, but not to belittle your question, actually. What I'm, what I'm trying to say, well, actually, means you were asking a great question, but the answer is, is not in the big things. The answer is in the little things. That's, to me, what's happening. That's the main thing that happens about the guys I was mentioning, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully what I'm trying to do is is in those little things. Those little things that you do, taking all that stuff and messing with the harmony, messing with the melodies, messing with the rhythms, in a way, is an evolution. Because you, uh, you're, you've checked out all that stuff and you're letting it come in, you know? I also play with Lonnie Smith, you know, I'm playing with Lonnie. His attitude is kind of like that. That's why he's still so vibrant and he's, you know, 70 and he's still making great records because he, that is actually his perspective, you know? That's kind of what he's going for, you know. So I guess uh, the next step for you is something that is uh, going to be with uh, minimal, more minimal than this quartet. And well, uh, that's, do, do you find I don't know, because I, I tend to also, I mean, if you look at my career or what, I, what I'm doing, I tend to have, I don't have radical... I think that some guys do that, oh, that's it, I'm, now I'm playing electric, you know, like you had this thing about 10 years ago where everyone, a lot of guys did that, and it was like kind of funny to me because if you look at the history of jazz, that's, they were trying to do what you did in the, in the 70s, and it's like 
fusion thing. Of course. Yeah, but it's like, you don't have to make a big deal and like do that, you know? Like to me, my music is always going to keep going like this. I may do some things like this, but my music is a flow, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, I don't need to, uh, fi- to jump off that boat. I don't feel like the need to do that, you know what I mean? Do you still find the group music inspiring? Of course, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Can we expect some uh, more uh, music, Greek music uh, played in your own way? Possibly. Possibly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, to be honest, right, the past few years have been crazy with, with tours and concerts and, uh, and doing the solo album and then doing Wave Upon Wave. So, I mean, to be honest, yeah, I mean, right now, I don't, I'm not sure what's going to happen right now. But it's exciting. I mean, it'll, be, it'll take time. Right now, uh, I'm actually kind of missing having time alone with my guitar, actually, because I've been on tour pretty, pretty constantly for the past year or two. And, and there's a lot of gigs coming up with Lonnie Smith and with my band for the new record. I'm looking forward to being alone with the guitar, te- doing some teaching, and kind of coming up with some new music, you know? And as far and playing in different settings with some different people, so okay. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's a, it's definitely a flux okay. moment for me. Uh, you know. We wish you to have your time with your guitar as soon as possible, yeah. so yeah. you can come up with some great more music uh, for us to hear. Sure. And we wish to see you again, uh, again as soon as possible as well. Yeah, yeah. And I hope people enjoy Wave Upon Wave. It's it's getting some great reception. It's on the it's been on the radio a lot in the United States, so that's great. And hopefully I can get uh, get back here to Greece soon. Uh, we love visiting here. Yeah, we love having you here as well. Thank you very much for this interview. Great, it was an honor. Good to see you. Για περισσότερες συνέντευξεις παρουσιάσεις εξοπλισμού και όλα ένα θέμα τα κιθάρας, επισκεφτείτε το κιθάρας ποτέ λιατζιάρ.